Good morning. So it's four o'clock in the morning, um, or half past silly, as I like to say, uh, and you get a call uh, to go out into uh, your community. And you arrive there, and it's dark because the local authority is switching off the street lights to save money. Um, and the person's house that you tried to find doesn't have a house number. And you uh, finally arrive there to find uh, the gentleman uh, upstairs uh, with his wife, pale, uh, sweaty, uh, saying his Hail Marys and uh, hoping that uh, he doesn't want to die. And he genuinely was saying his Hail Marys. So uh, after a quick assessment, uh, called this in. We've already got the uh, ambulance crew running. And I started in with uh, 300 milligrams of aspirin, uh, oxygen. Uh, the crew arrived, did a 12 lead. That was transmitted through to the uh, local hospital that span up the cath lab. Now, bearing in mind this is 4 o'clock, we loaded him onto a chair and carried him down some uh, quite winding stairs, and he was not a light gentleman. Uh, and if you've carried people down the stairs, as I know you have, uh, you know that can be quite challenging. And by six o'clock, uh, as you can see by this email that he uh, has allowed us to share, um, he had uh, been through the Catholic lab. Uh, <laughs> and by six o'clock, he'd had two stents fitted, uh, and he was sat up. Uh, and very grateful for a responder who, he doesn't know his name, uh, and that was me, by the way, um, but he knew the crew. I'm very grateful for uh, the work that we do, uh, having never heard of us uh, before. So that's me, uh, Ken Hopkins. Um, I've had a, a varied career, but I'm an engineer, and within the group, uh, of CFRs, there's half a dozen of us. We have plumbers, uh, teaching assistants, um, some guys retired, uh, and a policeman. And I'm an engineer, I'm not a clinician. And I work in the community with the training uh, that we've been given. Our training is initially over four days. It's actually five days now because um, of the uh, enhanced work that they do. And I uh, started in, in December 2011 with uh, the Southeast Coast Ambulance Service. But the training doesn't stop there. We actually go on uh, and we have online training, uh, some of which is, is compulsory and we have to, to do that. And we get our updates through the CCAM Live. And CCAM is the Southeast Coast Ambulance Service uh, for which I respond. And we have e-learning uh, and each month uh, we have training either in-house, uh, or actually we, have, we do that now at the Make Ready Centre with the Greens, uh, and we will practice what we see in real life. Um, and we have the opportunity to discuss, there's always the opportunity to discuss the cases that we have been uh, to, and there are always standard topics around uh, observations uh, and so on. Uh, and the CFRs have the opportunity to drive the learning uh, curriculum. And it's, as I say, it's based on real world. Uh, and we can see here uh, the lower slide uh, doing uh, ALS, because once uh, we've uh, arrived at the cardiac arrest and we're doing BLS, uh, and we've got the pads on, the crew arrive, what else can we do? Um, we're not going to stand aside. And we've become uh, very much uh, a great asset uh, in terms of the team and working within the team during that uh, cardiac arrest. We're also very um, lucky to have a chaplaincy uh, without, uh, throughout CCAM uh, to help us. So we book on, and we book on uh, using a text SMS system. And that system, once we are booked on, will alert us to incidents within our catchment uh, area. And we're alerted as the call taker is taking the call. So this isn't necessarily the uh, dispatcher. So the system does that. We'll have a request come through uh, to uh, attend that call. We can self-mobilize using, uh, by replying with the, with the uh, code M 
for mobile, and that's if we see it come through as a category A red one call. So cardiac arrest, you can self-mobilize to. Uh, all other calls that you see in your area, um, you have to wait for them to actually call you, the dispatcher to call you and say, can you respond to that call? When you arrive at the call, you uh, log your at scene time, and then when you've cleared the call, uh, you clear. Uh, B for backup, uh, when you want to know how far uh, the ambulance is uh, away from you, and that helps in communication uh, pretty much with the patient and also lets you know how far away the crew are. Uh, and then when you get home, um, you sort of app post home, and yes, you're ready to sort of continue uh, then and be ready for the next call. Uh, the last one, 20, is, um, oh heck, I need help, and I need lots of people down here uh, in blue uh, to come and sort this out, please, because it's all gone uh, very pear-shaped. Transport. Uh, we use our own cars, and we have uh, magnetic stickers uh, that we use on the cars. That primarily benefits uh, everybody, uh, including me. Uh, I live on the coast, and we have a lot of influx of people, and therefore lots of double yellow lines uh, and parking, and you want to park in bus stops and things. Uh, and you know, you've got the guys uh, with their parking meter hats on, uh, and I really don't want tickets. Uh, it benefits the patients. They're expecting to see, um, you know, smoking uh, tires, blue lights, uh, etc. Uh, and what they see is a private car pull up. Uh, outside the house. So it tells people that are stood outside waiting for an ambulance um, that you're actually the, uh, you're responding on their behalf. It also informs other responders. We talked about the, uh, uh, the incident earlier of you're down a dark street somewhere uh, or you're out on the beach somewhere. How do you differentiate your vehicle uh, from others so when the ambulance crew arrive, they know that that's where the incident is? And are the road users um, that uh, uh, you are parked there, uh, potentially uh, uh, inappropriately, uh, on a double yellow line because the patient has collapsed in the street uh, next to you or you're in the bus stop. Uh, we don't have lights. However, However, when it does get to uh, very dark periods, and these are short runs that we're doing, and we may do several calls in one day, uh, and my car has a four liter engine, and you start and stop that thing uh, at night at the moment, where, with my lights going and with my heaters going, and on more than one or two occasions, I've actually had to knock on the door uh, of the patient that I've been visiting and said, you know, in the dark, would you mind jump starting my car, please? Um, <laughs> uh, they've all said yes, uh, funny enough, they've, they've all said yes. I've had a crew say no, um, so, and my wife who's in the audience has come out to save me a couple of times. So what uh, CCAM have allowed uh, is uh, for this system to be uh, used. Uh, it's battery operated, it's not re you know, reliant upon um, the vehicle electrics, and therefore it doesn't run down the vehicle electrics. And it's there, we don't run on them, it's there you know, when you arrive, and if appropriate, um, that you can uh, use it as a beacon to say, this is where we are. Certainly it helps a lot when uh, you have people just collapsing in the street, um, or they've moved. In the car, uh, I have the uh, defibrillator, I have my primary response bag uh, that I have here. I have a, a second response bag um, that has uh, additional uh, items in it because of the scope of calls that we go to. I carry a separate burns kit. Um, when you look at scalding and burns, um, I've yet to be to one that is picture perfect of, of somebody that's just scalded themselves with a cup of tea. Um, I have the all-important blanket, uh, which is uh, a great comforter um, to patients. And then the other things, uh, a GPS. I might live in the local area. That doesn't mean I know the local area. Uh, and for me, a GPS is a vital part uh, of the kit. I live down by the beach. We have lots of people. 
Um, and so I have some little cones that I put out um, to sort of say, look, can you please not come into this area? And other stuff, just other stuff. Uh, the Clinel wipes to sort of wipe down your kit, the, uh, the blue roll, uh, the uh, Inconti pads. You know, when somebody's fallen and they are bleeding, and I mean they are bleeding, it's great. Uh, or you have to wash a head wound. Uh, it's great to be able to use those um, in order to protect uh, yourself and their clothes. And a variety of uh, torches. Uh, again, when you're driving down the street and it's dark, and the council has switched off the lights so you can't see anything, and people say, can you put the porch light on? And you'd be surprised how many people have got their porch lights on at two o'clock in the morning. Um, there's in the only house. So you, you go down the road trying to find the house. Within the defib kit, I will have uh, spare electrodes, um, gloves, uh, important, shears, taking clothes off. Um, they're not, people never like mannequins. Uh, they're never sort of nicely uh, clean uh, and with their clothes off. An all-important metronome. Um, I can never sing songs, and trust me, uh, I sing no better in the shower as I do when I'm under cardiac arrest. So the metronome uh, actually is uh, an idea that was introduced by Douglas, uh, and I used the one that uh, uh, he recommended, a towel, and some OP airways. Uh, to put an OP airway in uh, during cardiac arrest um, is what I carry. Then the response bag itself, um, there are two. There's the rucksack style, uh, and this is the primary response bag as used by the ambulances in our area. And it has the benefit of being familiar in terms of its layout and content to that of the ambulance. It means that, that you know, when you're on a cardiac arrest, bags get ripped open, torn apart, there's kit going everywhere, and people need to be able to reach in and find what they need. And that goes back to the training that we do every month. We work as a team uh, using real scenarios where we know what's expected and we know what the crews are going to call for next. So this is the situation that we're faced with. This is the equipment that they need. They want to be able to reach into our bag, which is the same as their bag, and know that they're pretty much going to find uh, the same equipment. So within there, I've got the uh, oxygen cylinder. We've got the uh, bag valve and mask. We have uh, various other airways um, that assist us. We have the nebulizer masks. We have uh, a few more airways, peak flow meter, and bags. Bags for the patient's drugs, uh, so that you know, we're not using a Sainsbury's or a Tesco's bag. Uh, we actually have the, uh, the green uh, hospital bags there, and the orange bags for clearing up. Um, invariably, it gets quite messy. Uh, and that does help an awful lot in just keeping the area clear for the other guys to work uh, so you're not falling around uh, and tripping over things. The drugs that we carry, and bearing in mind that um, within our team, we're none of us clinical, uh, but the training that we receive from the Southeast Coast Ambulance uh, allows us to work within uh, their protocol, within the protocol uh, that they provide, that enable us to go to these life-threatening cases uh, and deliver uh, aspirin, uh, salbutamol. They've taken out the uh, uh, glucogel uh, for diabetic um, cases. Normally, uh, if you go to a diabetic, uh, invariably, uh, you know, and they know that they're a diabetic, uh, they've got Mars bars, uh, um, they've got their cans of Coke. Uh, we carry uh, an SpO2 monitor uh, so that we're able to uh, look at the saturation level uh, of the patient and, if appropriate, give oxygen. Uh, we can also then do uh, um, uh, blood pressure, so we carry a cuff, a uh, stethoscope, and a temperature probe. The temperature probe uh, that we have is non-invasive, it's infrared. Uh, you point it at the patient's forehead uh, and it takes the temperature. And then we have to capture that information. 
I'm not sure whether you have the same thing, but you, you have patient report forms. Uh, so you, we capture those initial observations, which can be important because a patient's condition will change. Um, and I've, I've been to several whereby by the time the ambulance service arrived, they've pinked up quite nicely uh, and they're sort of sat chatting and they're saying, well, you know, what's wrong? Uh, and you're able to show them that. You can also calculate uh, at the bottom, when we're taught to calculate the, uh, what we call the MUSE and PUS scores uh, and call those through and if appropriate, um, the uh, patient would then be, uh, we call it ash heist, we call it you know, blue lighted into the hospital. This also forms part of the patient record and helps you in recanting what you found with the patient during the handover. So where do I live? Uh, southeast coast, uh, down near Folkestone, um, just along from there between sort of Folkestone and Rye or Folkest Folkestone and Eastbourne. Patients we got to see are uh, from the age of uh, zero uh, to the grave, and we will be called to all life-threatening uh, calls. Where I am, it's a retired community. They're mostly old people. Lots and lots and lots of care homes, lots of big uh, static caravan parks where people retire. Um, the demographic does change on weekends and holidays where we have lots of children. Uh, and the children, by the way, um, tend to be of an age group of around 50 or 60. Um, those are the kids. Um, and then the, uh, the grandkids uh, are then uh, in, the, in the younger age. My oldest has been uh, 105, a gentleman of 105, collapsed at the, uh, uh, the dinner table, uh, and my youngest has been a three-week-old difficulty in breathing uh, that I sort of ran to. So we go to uh, a good variety of uh, uh, patients in terms of their demographic and age. So as I said, we are, uh, oh, I live in a, a retirement community down on the beach. That's the, uh, the geographical area uh, of which I cover, uh, or which the team covers. And we will go to uh, TIAs, uh, also known as mini strokes, uh, obviously full strokes. Heart failure, uh, patients in heart failure. Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease being an umbrella sort of term uh, for breathing uh, uh, sort of difficulties. Diabetics. And falls, head injuries, uh, skin tears, uh, slips, trips, and as I like to say, broken hips. So yesterday, a gentleman pulled up uh, outside of the shop, and he was going to the shop where I go to get my hair cut. Um, there's quite a large curb uh, and a bus stop. And as he stepped off the bus stop, and he's uh, in his 70s, he fell and broke his hip. So the guy from the cafe picked him up and placed him in the bus stop, uh, and I was called out uh, to him, uh, naturally, as he fell with old people, the um, uh, older people, um, their skin does tend to tear quite easily, uh, so you're dealing with bleeding um, uh, and other uh, injuries around that of the broken hip. Patients that we are not sent to. So we're not sent to road traffic accidents. We're not trained to deal with uh, running around uh, the road. Uh, we will get sent to patients that have collapsed uh, in the road, and you might sort of uh, find that you turn up uh, and you find that the car has plowed into the side of the building uh, or the railings, uh, the patient has got out and collapsed, uh, but that part had not been told to the call taker. Uh, we're not knowingly sent to drunks. Um, yes, we're not knowingly sent to drunks. Uh, again, when people collapse in the street uh, with head injuries, as they've, uh, as uh, one lady who was 45, and this was last night, the night before last, uh, 45, drunk a bottle of wine, uh, and almost as much uh, in volume in gin and tonics, and decided to play uh, catch me uh, with her boyfriend around uh, the cars outside, fell and uh, cracked her head against the um, bumper of the van. Uh, collapsed patient in the street. That's what I was called to. Violence won't be called to violence, and that's why you have the code 20 on your phone. Uh, you can say, excuse me, please don't be violent to me, I just need to send a text. 
Uh, so we have a code 20 where you can call for uh, backup. And uh, clearly bleeding uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, more private areas uh, of the body, uh, unless it gets to a situation whereby it becomes life-threatening. But where do we treat? So um, through the rest of the slides here, you'll, you'll, I'll actually bring up um, messages uh, that I get on my phone. So bearing in mind that this is, uh, these messages are generated automatically by the system. Uh, so yes, the street, uh, up to the beach, um, people, uh, kids jumping off the seawall in the summer, breaking their arms, um, cafes. A lot of people go out walking. There are a lot of walking groups around by us. They get to the cafe. Um, and then they, they, that's the time that they decide to collapse. Uh, yes, we do get called to pubs. I get called to pubs um, quite a bit, but not where it's alcohol-related. It's where people have fallen, uh, they've had an injury, they, they walk into the pub. Um, also, pubs today uh, are not the pubs when I grew up, um, whereby they have to sell more than alcohol to make a living, so they serve food, so you have choking, uh, holiday parks. The static parks around me, if I look at New Beach, has over a thousand static caravans just on the one park. And I've got Camber Sands, New Romney, um, Romney Sands, Marley Park, and they're all very similar sized. Um, and the owners there will holiday, because it's not their permanent residence, uh, they will holiday for 11 months of the year in that, in that uh, caravan. Uh, buses. Lots of people have bus passes around by me, and I'm very fortunate that when I do respond on a bus, that they're always sat downstairs, because the youngsters go upstairs, but the people that are ill are generally downstairs on the bus. Um, so when in the in terms of our treating scenarios, you try treating somebody that has collapsed you know, on the uh, mid-seat of the bus. In cars, uh, and of course, uh, where uh, a lot of us go, uh, at home. We also get sent to multiple patients. So it's not necessarily just the one patient that we will go to see. Uh, we have here, you can see this is uh, the beach. I took this picture a couple of days ago. Um, and it's very slippery. Those are actually not steps. They're there to break the force of uh, the channel uh, as it comes in. As at high tide, uh, the bungalow that I live in, is actually below sea level. Um, so we do need these, these sea defences. So lots of strip trips, uh, slips and falls. Um, fitting. Now, uh, again, this was last week. Um, gentleman slipped and was said to be fitting on the beach. Now, did he fit before he slipped and cracked his head, or did he fall, crack his head, and then start fitting? We get interesting patients. This was two mornings ago, 4.30. Uh, woke up with central chest pain. Um, taken uh, two puffs of his own GTN. Um, he's a Malaysian gentleman that lives uh, uh, just by me. But as you can see, uh, he's got heart failure. Um, he's had bypass. He's got angina. He's uh, partially deaf. Uh, uh, deaf. Um, blind, diabetic. But accidents do happen, uh, and the popularity of home wood burners, I refer back to the burns kit uh, that I carry. Um, I'm not sure if they're becoming popular here, certainly they are in my area, these cast iron wood burners that people put into their, their hearths. Uh, lady um, fell into her wood burner um, and was quite badly burnt, and last weekend, uh, mum and dad decided to go to the local pub uh, she had the uh, soup delivered, sat her nine-month-old baby on her lap, and the baby pulled the boiling soup uh, over her. DNARs, um, we go to uh, a lot of people with these uh, in place. Um, and the text messages are sent out to update um, the crews that are running. And whilst this gentleman did have a DNAR in place, actually this was my second one uh, of the day as it were, they were back to back, two different patients. 
Uh, but this patient, although had terminal cancer, uh, lung cancer, COPD, uh, and the like, um, had gone to the toilet and had collapsed on the toilet floor. It had all become too much for him. Um, so I assisted in his uh, breathing, and he really, truly was a funny colour. Uh, GCS of three, he was very unresponsive. Um, very unresponsive. Uh, but we got him back. Um, so today was not his day. And that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is how we operate as community responders in the southeast. <laughs>